Hi boys and girls, welcome back to the three, third and fourth grade science club. This is our last class of the year and I was hoping that we would all be together again and I could see your beautiful faces before the end of the school year, but alas, that is not possible. So you get to see my face. If you would like to send me um, a picture of you doing one of these experiments, I would love to see that. I would love to see you guys one last time. So um, here we go for our last class. We are going to be talking about solar energy. So we did, the first class we did wind energy and we had our pinwheels and we talked about how the turbines spin and that spinning goes back to a generator, which is just magnets and wires, and that creates electricity. And then we learned about tidal energy, or, or even like water energy, just with dams, like large dams. The water comes through, it spins a turbine, and that turbine spins, and then it turns and spins a generator, which is wires and magnets, and then that creates electricity. And then we talked about geothermal energy, and that's using the heat from the earth, the energy that's already in the earth to come up as steam to spin a turbine and again, spin a generator, right? Our magnets and wires, and then that spins and creates electricity. So we learned about those three types of energy. Our last energy is a little bit different in how it is harnessed, how it is used for you and me. And so our last one that we're gonna be talking about is solar energy. So here it is, solar energy, energy from the sun. So go ahead and pause the program and write this in the back of your lab notebook. Okay, boys and girls, before we get too much further, let's talk about our Bible verse. I sent two because we have siblings and the page is pretty much blank, but you just need one for each of you. So I'm going to go ahead and chop up our bubble verse. Okay. So here is our bubble verse. Go ahead and cut it and glue it in the back. I'm sorry, on your bubble verse page. And so I'm going to just hold this up here and you can pause the program and go ahead and get it glued in. Okay. Before we start talking about solar energy, let's figure out where the sun even comes from. And this verse makes it very clear. Genesis is our first book of the Bible. This is the first chapter of the Bible. So in the very, 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 very beginning, we find out that God made two great lights. He made the larger light to rule over the day and the smaller light to rule over the night. He also made the stars. So we find out where the sun comes from. What do you think that great light to rule the day is? That's our sun. And so God made the sun for us, for our planet, so that we can survive. And then in the evening, we have the moon, which is our lesser light. So here's a fun fact. The moon actually reflects the light of the sun. It doesn't make its own. But, you know, in the sky, it looks very bright and it has a lot of light. And so that rules over the night. And he made the stars. <sighs> Y'all, Miss Sylvie loves stars. I really do. Sometimes I get sad that I can't see more in our sky. So um, one time I went to an observatory and I was able to see all these stars because they had a rule that if you lived within so many miles of the observatory, at night you could have no lights on outside. And so I went to something called a star party and I saw all these stars and it was amazing. And do you guys know what I want for Mother's Day? Do you guys know what a science teacher, I want a telescope. So I think for Mother's Day, <laughs> Mr. Sylvia is ready to buy me a telescope. I think for Mother's Day, I'm gonna get a telescope and I can't wait. I know, it's, it's exciting, it's very exciting. Okay, so God made the sun. And so let's find out how we can use that energy from the sun. Um, I'm just gonna tell you one thing that's really simple is plants use that energy from the sun. What they do is they take that energy from the sun and they take carbon dioxide that they breathe in 
and they and water that they bring in from their roots and they take those three things they combine them together in a chemical reaction and the energy from the sun is what helps that chemical reaction take place and then they turn it into sugar and they release oxygen so it's a really cool thing that plants do in them they just do it that converts that sun energy that changes that sun's energy into food for them and then plants become food for us and other animals and then so a cow goes and he eats the grass then the grass made its own food from the sun he eats the grass and then that cow is delicious and then we have a hamburger and we eat the cow and so we actually end up getting that energy from the sun it works its way down or up to us so that's one way that we get energy from the sun but we're kind of looking specifically about how we can use um, the energy from the sun to make electricity for our homes and something that we can use like in our everyday life to like get work done but food does help us do it you know what i mean you know what i mean we're trying to make electricity we're trying to make alternative energy to oil and gas and so i have this little page for you go ahead and find this page and go ahead and glue it in you can pause the program if you need time to glue it in Okay, let's talk about this page. So I'm gonna actually set it down. So cameraman, if you wanna move it down here, it just makes it a little easier for me to point to. Um, okay, so number one, solar cells, so these are special cells that are there, absorb income, incoming energy in the form of sunlight. So the sunlight comes into these cells. And you may have seen them, they look like this. I have a neighbor down the street who has this on their roof and um, so the sun comes into these cells I actually bought these cool little um, yard lights um, just off of Amazon we've been fixing up our yard we've been spending a lot of time in there it's nice outside and it's a nice change of pace to be able to go out there so I've been planting plants and I bought these and um, they're just from Amazon and uh, so this part is just to look pretty and this part is just to stab into your yard, okay? But this all comes off. And so I'm just gonna pull that off, okay? Because we, I really wanna talk to you guys about this. This is a solar cell. This is what it looks like. I can get closer, there we go. So this is what the solar cell looks like. And so light comes into this solar cell, okay? And then number two on our page says, the electrons begin to generate an electrical current. So what ends up happening is the sol sunlight comes into the solar cell and electrons begin to move. This is especially created to capture the energy from the sun. And then wiring captures the electrical current and, the com and combines it with power from other solar cells. So I don't know if these are four individual cells that's possible. Anyway, so it gets combined. And then um, this one is kind of cool because uh, it's got kind of like a built-in switch to know when it's dark. So I'm actually gonna pop this part off because this is the only, this is the part that makes the light from the sun, okay? All the extra stuff is just extra to make it look nice. So we have it go into the solar cell. I have a nice little switch here. I can turn this off if I want to. And it's got kind of a sensor to know that it's dark and so then when it's dark, I'm gonna put my hand over, the light comes on. So it, the sun comes in here, the electrons get moving, and then it's hooked up to a wire, it creates electricity, and then um, it can light up a little light bulb. And so I have 12 of these. I bought the warm light instead of the white light because I like it to look more yellow instead of white is awake I don't know anyway that was just a personal preference so it looks kind of dim but that's what I bought on purpose because I didn't want something that was painful okay and so um so anyway the, I these light up and they actually make quite a bit of light all 12 of them together and I have them in my planters and then they like shine around and then the plants cast pretty shadows and it looks super fancy but you know it's it's not but it, it looks nice. Okay, so that's our solar cell. 
And you might find other things in your house that also have solar cells. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about another one that you may have seen before, and that is a calculator. Now, calculators aren't as popular as they used to be because now that they're on cell phones, people aren't really like buying calculators. But um, we have a couple in our house and it has a solar cell on it. And so it uses the electricity from the light. It takes the light and it converts it into electricity to be able, be able to power the calculator. So that is a little solar cell. Somebody else uses solar electricity. And I thought this one was really fun to see. Um, it's a giant field and this is Disney World. And what do you think their solar field is shaped as? Mickey ears, of course, right? And if you wanna get an idea of how big this is, you can see the road and you can see a little car right there. See the little tiny little dot right there? That's a little car. So that gives you an idea of how big this solar field is. And I don't know that it powers their entire park. I didn't do a deep dive on the research to find out how much energy they get from their solar cells. But I thought that was a really fun little solar field for you guys to check out. And maybe I'll look up and find out how much electricity this actually produces for Disney World. So thought that was a cool thing and I wanted to share that with you. Okay. So this should be glued into your notebook. This page should be glued into your notebook along with your Bible verse. And so we are gonna move along to using that solar energy to create, using solar energy to create a solar oven to make a little bit of crayon art, okay? So let me kind of explain to you what we're gonna do here. Um, we want to capture the, uh, I'm not asking you to make the solar cell. I just want to, I want to be clear that I'm not asking you to make one of these. I'm just, we just want to capture the heat that is coming from the sun into some kind of box or contraption to be able to melt some crayons into some design. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're not making solar cells. Okay, I don't want to <laughs> on the last day of class. Okay, that's a little bit. So um, I'm gonna take a piece of paper and I'm gonna make some crayon art. I have some old crayons here and I have a penny. I think a quarter might be better. I'm just gonna, you know, do some shavings. Huh. Gotta really push on there, right? Just make some crayon art. Got some shavings of some orange crayon and I got some shavings of some brown crayon. It's got a real 1970s retro vibe going on there. All right, all right. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. And oh, and green. All right. And just for some contrast, let's do a little bit of pink. to keep it on your paper just to keep mom happy we don't want mom getting upset because you got little shavings of crayon everywhere it doesn't have to be a lot just a little bit All right gotta kind of push hard with the penny All right, let's see if we can get this to melt in a solar oven. Now, I use these for my class, and so we'll do one in here. And um, it's this is what I use for my class. Look, there's even some of this. Look. It's okay. We're not going to be eating this. And then um, the way that that I have this work is a little flap comes up like that, and it projects the light in here and then there's a black piece of paper in there um but i think what we and you can make one like this it's actually quite easy you just you take um 
box cutters are best. Just cut along here and here and here. And then you have a little nice little flap. And then you put aluminum foil on this and you wanna keep track the heat in. So then there's saran wrap here, okay? And then there's a piece of black paper there. But I think this is probably something more like what you have at home, something more like, you can make this, that's no problem. But let's figure out how we can turn this into a solar oven that works. And uh, my son, my son still has cereal left. I just pulled it out and I rolled it up like a bag of chips and I put it back in the, um, in the pantry. So let's figure out how we can take um, a cereal box and turn it into a solar oven that would work, that would be like our pizza box and capture the heat, okay? So here is our little engineering challenge. How can we melt crayons using solar energy? So let's imagine and plan using our cereal box, aluminum foil and plastic wrap, and a black sheet of paper, okay? How can we melt crayons in our using solar energy using something like this so go ahead and pause the program i'm looking for my pencil i have problems with those that sort of thing too let's go ahead and pause the program and let's do some imagining and planning so i'm gonna do mine y'all pause and y'all do yours okay that's what I'm going to do. I don't know how to show that it's lifted. Maybe like that. Yeah. And then I'm going to wrap that with aluminum foil, plastic wrap. Okay. Okay. I think I'm ready. Okay. So this takes some cutting and maybe mom needs to help with this because I'm going to actually, oh, maybe I'll, you know what? I'm going to cut like that. I'm going to do a little cut. Yeah. There we go. Just need to be able to pierce it, right? And do a little cut like that. I just cut like right on the edge like that. And I'll do the other side too, so that I can get in there. And I cut that way. And you, look, if this seems overwhelming, you can make yours look just like mine. That works too. Okay, so there we go. So I have a little flap and I am going to wrap my little flap here with aluminum foil. So let's take this. Like that. And then um, inside we need a black I'm gonna put the black paper on the inside. Uh, it's too big, so I'm gonna cut it in half. Half-ish. And I'm gonna put that in there, like that. Ooh. I think we're getting there. And then I need to cover this hole so I can trap the heat in there. So I'm gonna take some saran wrap like that. I'm going to cover this area and it's okay if it's more than I need but this is I think this is actually well actually no I think that'll be good because then I'm not gonna be worried about it like coming off I had tape ah yours if you have a little bit of a different design you can build yours so this should do the only thing I'm worried about is there's a little hole right there I could tape it onto there 
All right, we want to trap that heat. I could tape it like right there. That. We want to keep that heat all trapped in. I'm using a lot of tape. But it's from the dollar store, so I don't get too worried about it. <laughs> okay. My cameraman's laughing at me. Okay. So this is my design. And the pieces are kind of movie, so we're just gonna be careful sliding this in here. So if you look inside, you can see, and then I'm gonna close this, which is kind of nice that a cereal box will do that. Right, just close like that. Like that. Does that work out okay? And then, um, we kind of want to angle that, but that's actually working really nice. If it's not working nice for you, you can take a, a pencil like this, you know, just a color pencil, and you can tape it to try to kind of help it angle up. But mine is kind of staying, and maybe that's just um, the type of material that it's made out of. That's actually working really nice for me. You can even take a piece of tape and go, okay, I want it to stay just like that. And you can tape it like that to create like kind of like a little hinge, you know, but I'm really pleased with that. So, um, you know, I forgot to grab my uh, thermometer, but that's okay because I can take the temperature later. So I'm actually going to take this outside. It's kind, today's Sunday, so it's, it's a little bit of a cloudy day. The sun is coming and going. When I woke up, it was totally cloudy, but now it's like coming and going. Oh, the sun just came out. So I'm gonna go try to find a sunny spot and I'm gonna try to angle this to, to capture the light and to reflect into there. Okay, we ready? Okay. Oh, and then the sun disappeared again. Okay, it's okay, we'll figure this out. Boys and girls, just a safety note, never look at the sun. You can really, really hurt your eyes, okay? So we wanna look at where this, oh, here the sun just poked back out. And if you look right here, there's like a shade spot here and then the sun is over here. So I wanna make sure that I'm getting the sun into there. And if you look over here, you can see um, where the sun is coming in, right? And you can see where it's reflecting in. We want the shiny part of your aluminum foil um, there and so I'm just gonna leave that here and do, we're gonna do um, a couple more things and then we'll come back afterwards and see if I get any melting action happening and with my crayons okay all right stay stay we'll see what happens <laughs> all right it's a little windy too not a lot windy but just a little See my little solar lights here, you know, and we just leave them in here and then they light up and it looks so pretty at night. And Mr. Sylvie, look at, look at all the flowers. These are peppers for Mr. Sylvie and he's gonna get so many peppers. He's not gonna know what to do with himself. Do we have, where was that one we saw? Oh, look, there's a little baby pepper, little baby pepper. So that looks really good. Yay, Mr. Sylvie. And we got a little strawberry coming. See our little strawberry? Little baby strawberry. And then this was a flower, but that's gonna turn into a strawberry. Yay. Okay. Oh, is there another one? Oh no, that's just a little petal. Okay. All right. <laughs> I smacked my strawberry plant. That wasn't nice. <laughs> All right, come on in. <laughs> So I'm gonna take our little solar oven design and set it to the side for now. And uh, we're gonna do, so this is something that is usually very much requested in my class. They want an explosion, right? They want some kind of like boom explosion. And um, you know, I don't really wanna clean stuff off of my ceiling but I'm gonna try to give you a little bit. <laughs> yes, yeah, I don't wanna clean that. I just had it painted like, I don't know, was that like a year ago? 
It was about a year ago I had it painted. I don't want to have to clean stuff off. But I think we can do a little bit of something exciting, a little chemical reaction. And so um, I'll fix that. <laughs> it's okay. I'll fix that. Um, so you should have something called elephant toothpaste. And that's what this is often called. Boys and girls, it's not actually toothpaste. Do not make this at home and think you can brush your teeth with it, okay? It's just what it's called because it's big. Okay, problem. How can we make elephant toothpaste? Materials, pan, and just something to pick it up. Miss Sylvie's gonna model this. You don't have to do this at home. There's a couple special ingredients. So uh, I have a pan, I have a bottle, and this is just a bottle. We've been washing our hands a lot lately. So this is just a, um, a hand soap bottle that I had. So we need 125 milliliters of 6% uh, hydrogen peroxide. It's really hard to be able to buy this. So we bought this at a special salon uh, place. Actually, you guys know what? Mr. Sylvie bought it for me and he went in, he's like, my wife needs something for her class. And they're like, is she a science teacher? He said, yeah. They said, oh, okay, this is what she needs. And so he came back with this. And even though it doesn't say 6%, it says 20 volume clear develop. I had to Google and make sure, because I was like, I don't know that this is what I need, but it, it is actually what I need. I'm just not, yeah, it says it down here. I'm just not gonna do, what it wants, like what it's made to do. I'm gonna use it for science instead. But it's something for your hair. I don't even know. Okay, and um, 20 milliliters of yeast. So here's just yeast, and this is just from the grocery store. You make bread with it, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And 60 milliliters of water, and I already got my water. So this is just water from the tap, okay? And then uh, a squirt, I know that doesn't sound very scientific, but it's gonna be okay. A squirt of dish soap, liquid dish soap. And uh, I'm reading backwards, I'm sorry. Five drops of food coloring. And I thought if we have something oozy, it should be green, right? Like, 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 you know, the ooze. I don't know, I was just thinking green would be good. So, and I have this like lime green um, food coloring. I thought that would be fine. And a cup, but I'm actually going to just mix it here in this measuring cup. And a craft stick. And a funnel. I don't have a funnel. I also need safety goggles, so I'm going to run in a second and get those. Okay. Procedures. Place the bottle in a pan to catch the mess. Your teacher will pour the hydrogen peroxide into the bottle. Squirt the soap and food coloring into the bottle. Mix the yeast and water in the cup with the craft stick. Using the funnel, pour the yeast mixture into the bottle and step back. Oh, count how many, oh, I'm sorry, that's a mistake. Six and seven should not be there. I will delete those. You will not have them on your page. Okay, and step back. Hypothesis, if we mix the yeast with the hydrogen peroxide, then what will happen? So go ahead and answer this question while I run and get safety goggles. Oh, Mr. Sylvie's gonna hold it and film it. Go, Mr. Sylvie. Okay, so I'm back with my safety goggles and I went ahead and grabbed the thermometer for our solar oven too. And if you need more time to answer your hypothesis, go ahead and pause the program to do that. So you ready to get started? And then there's a place right here for you to draw a picture of what happens. Okay, okay, here we go, here we go. Okay, 
I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Okay, so how much? Uh, okay, so it says to do the hydrogen peroxide first. Okay, here we go. So place the bottle in the pan. Pour hydrogen peroxide into the bottle. I don't know if I need to shake this or not. I'll give it a little shake. Just a little. It's been sitting on my counter for three years. Um, okay. So I need 125 milliliters. I have my milliliters over here. And I'm gonna pour. to pour this into here. I can smell this hand soap and it smells lovely. Okay, now it says squirt the soap and food coloring into the bottle. Squirt. One more squirt. There we go. And then five, five drops. Oh, five drops is enough. Mix the yeast in water. And how much yeast does it say to do? It says 20 milliliters of yeast. You know what? I think it's supposed to be just a tablespoon. I'm just gonna do one packet. I will change yours to say one packet of yeast. Okay. And you take the craft strip and you stir. We're basically activating and waking up the yeast. Because y'all, do you know yeast is alive? It is, it's alive. And all those little bubbles that you get in your bread when you're making bread or when you buy bread, those little bubbles, those are yeast burps. The little thing is eating up the sugar and they're making little bubbles. Yeast is alive. Did you know that, Mr. Sully? He knew that. It's one of my students. Sometimes it kind of blows their minds. Okay. Here we go. You guys ready? Let's see what happens. Woo! <laughs> Look at that. It didn't really shoot up, but that's pretty oozy, isn't it? And you know what's really cool is um, it actually gets warm too. It's what we call an exothermic reaction. Look at all of those bubbles. Look at that. Is that cool? Do you think it looks like elephant toothpaste? Do you think that's a good way to describe how it looks? <laughs> Y'all, it's going to fill up my pan. <laughs> and then what am I going to do? Look at all of that. Isn't that fun? And it's still going. <laughs> oh, look how fun that is. It's not very green. I probably should have gone with 10 drops, but I think it's still good. Is it still oozing? It is oozy. Ooze. <laughs> all right, so go ahead and draw a picture of what you see of all of the ooze filling my pan. It's starting to slow down a little bit. Now it's yeah, Mr. Sylvie, put your hand under here and tell me what it feels like. Warm. It's warm, yeah. It's an exothermic reaction. It gets warm. The yeast mixing with the hydrogen peroxide is warm. And I had a dirty, sandy pan, so. But, okay, go ahead and pause the program and draw a picture of your elephant toothpaste as it, oh, look at this, it's still oozing. Look at that. <laughs> it's very oozy. And my 
my pan is almost completely full of bubbles. Is that cool? <laughs> it's not really an explosion. It's more of an ooze, right? But it's a fun ooze. It's still going and going. Okay. I hope you have a nice picture drawn of what you see here for our elephant toothpaste. Go ahead and glue that into your notebook. I'm going to leave these on while it's still going. All right. And I will set that to the side. Or should I? I'll leave it here. I'm gonna leave it here. I'm gonna leave it here. And um, while our solar oven is still going, I'm gonna go ahead and read you this story. This is one that we um, we did. Um, we started. Do you guys remember? I think it was before Christmas break. We started reading this. And we, we like time was up in class and we had to go and I said, oh, I'll finish it. And I, I never finished it. Do y'all know it's been sitting, like I've had it sitting on my desk and it just stares at me. And, it, and every time I walk by, it goes, you didn't finish me. You didn't finish me. And I have guilt, oh, crushing guilt, for not finishing this book that I told you I would finish reading. So I thought on our last class, it's my last chance to fulfill my promise to you to finish this book. So that's what we're gonna do. So you guys ready? And I'm just gonna start back at the beginning because um, it's been so long. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you remember, but it's kind of cool because the Magic School Bus, I think it's safe for me to, yeah, it stopped moving. I'm gonna, um, the Magic School Bus traveled all over the world looking at all these different animal biomes and ecosystems, which is what we study. Remember rainforests and tundra and taiga and all those things. And so, um, speaking of which, when we go back outside, I'll give you an update on our pinto beans that we planted for our shallow growing for our um, tundra. We we're learning about the tundra and has it had only an inch of soil. The rest was permafrost, permanently frozen. And so we did some shallow growing to see the roots going sideways instead of down. And so I'll show you those pinto beans when we go back outside to look at our solar oven. And our solar oven is getting some nice sun. The little flap is blowing in the breeze, but it is getting some sun. So it'll be interesting to see if it's trapping the heat and melting those crayons and we'll see what happens. I don't know what temperature it is outside. Alexa, what is the temperature? Right now, it's 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so it's Today, not... expect a high of 88 degrees. 88 degrees. It's going to get warm. Enjoy your morning. Thank you. She gives me way more information than I'm interested in, but that's okay. Okay, here we go. So, the Magic School Bus explores the world of animals. If you come to our school, if you had come to our school early last Monday morning, you would have wondered who Arnold was talking to, since he was the only one in the classroom. Please be there, please be there, he was repeating as he pawed frantically through the lost and found box. Arnold was talking to his glasses, which he had left at school Friday afternoon. Since Arnold needs his glasses to find his glasses, he wasn't having much success. Poor Arnold. I have been in Arnold's situation where I'm looking for my glasses and I can't find them because I don't have my glasses. Luckily for Arnold, Wanda helped him find the missing glasses. But that's not all they found. Hey, there is something alive in here, said Arnold. Burrowed beneath all the lost and found junk was a small animal about the size of a small cat. But this was definitely not a cat. It looked more like a fox with really gigantic ears. Everyone wondered what the little animal was and how it got into our classroom. Keisha said, I heard that the local wildlife farm just closed down and returned all the animals to their natural habitats. I'll bet our mystery animal was left behind. And then got lost, said Tim, and found. This is terrible, said Dorothy Ann. According to my research, a wild animal needs to be in its own natural habitat. We don't have a clue what this animal is or where 
it vlogs. Big ears like that. That's interesting. You probably pronounced the pr pr you probably pr pronounced. I guess so. You probably pronounced the problem, D.A., said Miss Frizzle, but never fear, a solution is near. The Frizz told us we were about to go on another one of our fabulous field trips. We sort of expected that from the way she was dressed. We would visit six different habitats and see which one seemed right for Misty. That's the name we gave our mystery animal. How will we know which habitat is right, Miss Frizzle, said Carlos. What do you think, class, Miss Frizzle asked us. We should explore each habitat, said Keisha, and see if Misty seems suited for life there, said Tim. Wanda suggested that we compare Misty with the other animals we see in each place. Maybe we'll even see another animal that looks just like Misty, she said. And then, said Ralphie, we can make a decision based on our observations. A promising plan, that's for, that's sure to pay off, said Miss Frizzle. Then she said those famous words, to the bus. As you all know, said Miss Frizzle, you should never handle wild animals. So Liz has created a deluxe dwelling where Misty can travel first class. We noticed that Liz had even brought along the lost and found box since Misty seemed so comfortable in there. While we were still admiring Misty's cool room, the bus, or should I say the bus jet, took off for our first destination, the Arctic. It's very cold in the Arctic with lots of snow and ice. So Miss Frizzle gave us all warm clothes to wear and we got super viewers that would let us see wild animals from far away. So this is what we call the tundra, right? <clears throat> the first animal we saw was a polar bear. Its white fur was hard to see against the white snow. When we zoomed in on the polar bear's paws, we could see that they were very big with thick fur on the bottom. Miss Frizzle told us that the polar bear has a thick layer of fat under its skin. The fat keeps the polar bear warm, even when swimming in freezing cold water. Next, we sighted a snow snowy owl. It was almost all white too. The snowy owl has to live mostly on the ground because there are not many trees in the Arctic. Hey, look over there, yelled Carlos. He was excited because he had spotted an animal that looked a little like Misty. Miss Frizzle said it was an Arctic fox, but it was different from Misty. It was white and had much longer fur. Its ears weren't anything at all like Misty's. And when we looked at its paws, we could see it had furry foot pads like the polar bears, only smaller. The snowshoe hair was white and had furry foot paws too. So here's the owl. Where's the Arctic fox? You see the Arctic fox on here? Oh, this is the Arctic fox. They're comparing the two. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. She's showing that during the summer. Oh, there's the Arctic fox. If you look at the ears, they're a lot smaller than Misty's, right? We were getting a little cold, so we climbed back on board the polar bear bus. Misty had burrowed down in the lost and found box again. It looked like Liz and Misty were becoming pals. Well, class, said Miss Frizzle, what do you think? Does Misty belong in the Arctic? We all agreed that the Arctic just didn't seem like the place for Misty. Want to know what a jaguar looks like? Just take a look at our bus as we landed on a tree limb in the tropical rainforest. What a difference from the Arctic. The rainforest is so hot and steamy. It feels like the bathroom after you take a really hot shower. And as you might guess, it rains a lot. We climbed down rope ladders to see what animals we could find. There's a lot of animals in there. Down on the first forest floor, we used our super viewers to look at some strange looking animals. One of the strangest was the tapir. It spends hours keeping cool in the water with only its nostrils sticking out. Another was the peccary. We saw a whole family of peccaries digging in the ground for roots and insects to eat. Aiming our super viewers straight down at the ground, we saw a rhinoceros beetle, one of the world's largest insects. Most of the animals on the forest floor seemed to be brownish. They blended in with the colors of leaves and mud. We raised our viewers to see what animals might be up in the trees? Whoa, said Ralphie. 
Look at that bright green snake. At first I thought it was part of the leaves. That's an emerald tree boa, said Miss Frizzle. It almost never comes down to the ground. The long-nosed bat and the woolly possum stay up in the trees too. She told us that being able to climb trees is one of the many forest animals, is one of the way many forest animals stay safe. Hurry up, everyone, called Miss Frizzle. Let's have a look at the canopy. When Miss Frizzle said hurry up, she really meant it, meant up. We all found ourselves floating up to the very top level of the rainforest. Some of the animals up here have such bright colors, said Ralphie. DA said that according to her research, bright colors can spend can send lots of messages to other animals. Like, I'm poisonous, don't, so don't eat me. I'm looking for a mate. Let's get back down to business, said Miss Frizzle, and down again we went back to the forest floor. What a surprise to see Liz and Misty down there. Liz was climbing up a tree trunk, trying to get her pal Misty to follow her, but Misty wasn't climbing. No way. The peccaries and tapirs didn't fly or climb either, and Misty was sort of brownish like them, so we thought the rainforest floor was a possibility, but we didn't have enough information to be sure. So we decided to check out some more habitats. Anyway, it was starting to rain again. Okay, so she can't climb like the peccaries. Maybe the rainforest, I don't know. Now you're thinking up a storm, said Miss Frizzle. Before you could say the words North America temperate forest, so that's a deciduous forest, that's where we went. According to my research, announced DA, a place that is temperate is not hot like the tropics, or cold like the Arctic. It's in between. This place looks like the woods behind our school, Arnold noticed. We should get back to class. I think we're missing math right now. But you know the frizz. If you want to learn more, you've got to explore, she said. Most of the animals we saw in the forest seemed like old friends. We all recognized the deer, raccoon, chipmunk, and bear right away. I've never seen a red fox before, said Arnold. Hey, there's a gray fox up there in the tree. What's that weird looking bird with the red head? asked Wanda. According to my bird guidebook, said DA, that's a wild turkey. Is it a turkey? This was a tough one. Those foxes looked an awful lot like Misty. Misty doesn't climb trees like the gray fox, said Tim. And we learned that climbing is an important skill for a forest animal. But the red fox doesn't climb either, Carlos reminded us. We were almost ready to agree with Arnold and go home when Keisha said, but what about Misty's ears? How come those other foxes' ears are so much smaller? I vote we keep looking, said Wanda. The African grasslands was our next stop. So that's prairie. We learned that, um, we learned uh, savanna is the word that we used. Okay, so the African grasslands was our next stop. Grasslands are also called savannas. It doesn't rain here much, only at one time of the year during the rainy season. The grass grows quickly, so it's pretty tall, but there's not enough rain for many trees to grow. We were in the tropics, so it was hot, but it was dry, not like the steamy rainforest. You can see a long, long way in any direction, class. So get ready to witness the wildlife, said Miss Frizzle. So this reminds me of Lion King, right? All the different creatures. We were having a great time in the bus jeep, thanks to our super viewers. We could see baboons, a rhinoceros, gazelles, impalas, jackals, and giraffes. A lot of the animals around here have long legs, said Carlos. That's so they can run fast and leap through the tall grass, Carlos, said Miss Frizzle. Hey, I see an animal that looks a lot like Misty, shouted DA. Look at its ears. Close, Dorothy Ann, said Miss Frizzle but there's one big difference between Misty and that bat-eared fox. Get a look at those legs. We saw what the frizz was getting at. The bat-eared fox's legs were much longer than Misty's. Same with the this, this serval, a big-eared cat that had very long legs too. Well, that's certainly interesting. Tim's report on ears gave us some good ideas. We figured that Misty's large ears were a clue that our mystery animal belonged in a hot climate. So we ruled out the temperate forest because it doesn't get very hot there. 
Since Misty's legs seemed be better for digging in the lost and found box than for leaping through the grasslands, we decided to move on. But we were still considering the rainforest floor. The surroundings are soggy, Miss Frizzle warned us as, as climb, as a wee, a wee's very there. We climbed off the bus in the Everglades. Habitats like this aren't called wetlands for nothing. The ground in the Everglades was mucky and squishy, like a giant swamp. We didn't do this one in our class. We didn't really focus on this one. Which is what the Everglades really are. A swamp full of birds, alligators, snakes, muskrats, frogs, and sea turtles. And let's not forget the insects, like dragonflies and mosquitoes. They were all adapted in some way to their waterlogged world. Liz had lured Misty out of the bus again. This time she was trying to get her buddy to take a dip, but Misty wasn't any more interested in swimming than in climbing trees. Misty doesn't swim, slither, or fly, and those legs don't look anything like an ibis, said Wanda. So we crossed the Everglades off of our list of homes for Misty. We were still thinking the rainforest floor might be Misty's habitat, but we had one last place to explore. The desert was hot and the ground was sandy and dry. There were hardly a cloud in, this, in the bright blue sky. We couldn't see any trees at all. In fact, we didn't see many plants, period. Look carefully, class, and you'll see some animals that are especially adapted for this dry, hot habitat. I see an animal that looks like a tiny porcupine, said Carlos. It was a desert hedgehog. It beats the heat by burrowing into a hole all day and coming out at night. It can survive for 10 whole weeks without food or water. There's a sand grouse, said Ralphie. When I did my report on birds, I found out that this one flies up to 40 miles to find water for its babies. Interesting thing, the father brings the water droplets back in its feathers. Of course, we saw a camel. People ride them in the desert. Everyone knows the camel can go without water for a long time. I see a tiny little animal digging a hole in the sand, said Wanda. That's a jerboa, Miss Frizzle told us. It keeps cool by digging a burrow and staying in it during the day. Its ears are kind of big for such a small animal, said Arnold. Hmm, said Miss Frizzle. Misty's color, ears, and digging habits all seem to say desert. We were just about to tell Miss Frizzle that we made our decision when Arnold shouted, Aha, that clinches it. And sure enough, there was another animal that looked almost exactly like Misty. Now we knew we'd made the right choice. The frizz said we were right. She said that Misty was a finnick, a type of fox related to the dog. Finnicks are amazingly well adapted for desert life. They stay cool in the desert by burrowing into the sand in the daytime. They're extra long, sorry, extra large ears help them stay cool. Long thick hair on the sides of their, the Finnick's ears keep the sand out. As we wave goodbye to our friend Misty, to our friend, Misty was already digging a cool, comfortable burrow. We were glad to be back in our own habitat, but we all miss Misty, especially Liz. But knowing Miss Frizzle, I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up back in the Sahara Desert someday. Well, we'll make Misty's burrow our first stop. And that's the end. Isn't it cool how God has made all of these animals special for their own habitats? <laughs> I think that's an amazing God that we serve and worship, that he made all these animals just right for their environment that they live in. And one last look at our elephant toothpaste. We got lots of little holes in there now. Our foam is going away and it's still a little bit warm, but I thought I'd just show that to you real quick. We also need to go out and take a look at our solar oven see if I have a nice uh, crayon decoration and then we'll come back and we'll fill this in um, our sheet here. Okay, so let's head outside.
melting not very much melting let's see if it's gotten any warmer in there than it is because we know out here let's see what it is out here out here it says it is 28 degrees Celsius so let's put this in here oh yeah there's a nice cool breeze so we'll put that in there and see um, while I'm waiting for uh, my thermometer we're gonna go over and take a look at our uh, pinto beans, okay? That I planted, and you can kind of see some of the progress. And then we'll see if we have temperature change in our solar oven. Okay. So these are our pinto beans. Something is eating my pinto bean leaves, which is kind of sad, but look, look, we're getting there. Look how big these pinto beans are. Let me see. Do I have any ones that are yellow? Because yellow would mean it's ready for picking. I don't have any yellow ones there. There's some yellow leaves. Oh, they're getting really big. Look how big. That's probably getting close. Yeah? All right. I'm probably getting close to some pinto beans. And here's my squash and zucchini. And then I went ahead and planted some corn. And this is my corn that I planted. See that? That's the corn that's coming up in there. It looks like grass almost because it's a monocot, the way grass is. And so you can tell by the leaf that it's very straight. The veins on the leaf are very straight in a monocot versus a dicot where they kind of branch out. So, all right. There's a little garden update. And there's some weeds I gotta pull. A little garden update and even though it doesn't look moist I mean I'll come out here and water later but if you get underneath the dry level it's it's pretty moist in there okay let's go see what our thermometer is doing on our solar oven yeah it's really shady day oh it is it is more it's 32 degrees Celsius inside my solar oven compared to 28 degrees Celsius outside of my solar oven. I might just leave them in there. If, if I get anything ex interesting happening today as I leave it in there longer, um, I will post another video. And so you'll be able to see the update on that, okay? All right. Okay, let's go in and finish filling out our, um, our sheets. And then that will be it for our lesson. All right. Okay, so it says test and evaluate. I don't know, it's not getting very warm. So, I don't know. I might write something on here. Um, you know, I'm gonna move this out of the way. And I'm gonna turn sideways so I can write. And my cameraman's gonna turn sideways this way so that you can see what I'm writing. So I think what I'm gonna write is something like um, a, a cloudy day, not much warmer. No crayons melted after, what, 30 minutes? Improve, I'm gonna leave it outside longer. If you remember, Alexa said that it was gonna get to 88 degrees today, so maybe it'll get hot enough by the end of the day to melt crayons and if I have some melted crayons, I will give you an update. So make sure you glue this into your lab notebook. Um, I hope that you got a bit of a better um, crayon design than I did. Maybe your day is sunnier than my day is. Um, we did have the temperature rise a little bit in there, but not so much that um, we got to melt our crayons. So I don't know, I don't know. All right, boys and girls. 
this is Miss Sylvie signing off for the year. And I hope to see you next year. I think um, some of you have already registered for my class next year. And so I'm very excited to see you in the fall. And um, if you haven't, um, I wish you the best in your education endeavors. Please always love science. Science is fun and exciting. You can learn and discover so much. Um, so I hope you guys have a wonderful summer and I hope to see most of you next year.